<laughs> Welcome everyone to this month's first Friday's acoustic seminar. Um, this month we have Andreas Hudelmeyer, who works in uh, London, and um, he's going to share his experiences with um, his bridge tuning and measurements. So as usual, we will have plenty of time for questions and discussions afterwards. Um, but if you have a pressing question during the presentation and you can't wait, please um, use the chat um, feature. So um, Andreas. Right, okay, uh, let's try and share my screen again. And here we go. Can you see my first slide? Yes. Right. So I'm going to talk about bridge constants. I would like to talk to you about my journey with bridges and how I found a practical way to measure our bridges in more detail to help me with our quest for better tone. Now is it working? Yeah. Why do I measure bridges? Well, because I want to help my customers to sound like Oistrach here. That's the underlying um, idea. Now, here with the next slide, we're in Oberlin, traveling back in time. Some of you might remember the scenario. You might spot Tom King and Terry Bowman and Andrea Sanre and Guy Rabiu in the foreground and not quite sure who else is in the background. Well, Andreas, we've lost your audio, I, or I can't hear your audio. Fan? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, why don't you do, uh, start over again from this slide? Right, you can hear me now, fine. Yes. Um, right, here we are back in, in Oberlin, traveling back in time. Um, some of you might recognize the scenario. Um, it's the 2004 uh, Oberlin Acoustics Workshop. We've got Tom King and Terry Borman and Andrea Zanre and Guy Rabier here. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't um, find a picture with Fan and Joseph who organized um, the workshop and I think together with Greg Alf, if I see that right. Um, anyway, um, all these years ago, um, this really was uh, when this subject was um, bridges and we cut countless bridges, as you can see on the slide. And we measured bridges. We measured their F rock here in a very solid looking vice and by chance as well with some um, weights attached to it. We've got a, in this case, a piezo strip and with this plectrum, we would flick up this arm here and then the piezo strip would pick up the um, vibration and that would be analyzed. And then we would measure the sound spectrum of the instruments. This is the rig of George Bissinger with lots of microphones built into this arc. So this was, I think, my introduction to the rocking mode F-Rock. This is the first in-plane mode or resonance of the violin bridge. This is a resonance of the bridge where the top of the bridge swings right and left around the waist. It moves in this way at a particular pitch or frequency, which we call F-Rock. So I'm sure many of you are more than familiar with this, but for the few who might not be, it basically does this. And the pitch or the frequency it does this at all um, at uh, is what we call F rock. This is just the very basis upon which future measurements are based on. That's why I'm repeating this. 
Uh, no, I want to go forward. So why is it important? The vibrations of the string pass through the bridge. F rock acts a, like a low pass filter and the, the lower F rock, the more high frequencies we are filtering out. Depending on how much we have, that might be a good or a bad thing. A low pass filter for those who don't know is basically one that lets the frequencies that are below a certain frequency pass and filters away at least pass, uh, part of it, uh, what's above. So, the principles of tuning F-Rock are very simple. If we reduce the spring areas, mainly the waste here between the kidneys, um, the F-Rock will go down. Now, so if we cut, basically, just to repeat this, if we cut this waste more narrowly, or if we reduce the thighs here, or the ankles, or even the areas between the heart and kidneys, we are lowering, well, we're making the bridge more flexible, which lowers F-Rock. So much so simple. And the other principle is if we re reduce the mass at the top, we increase F-Rock. So for a long time after my first Oberlin Acoustics workshop, I just used these principles of bridge tuning without actually doing much measuring. So basically that means I was trying to keep the areas, the spring areas strong and to cut away what I was able to um, on the top to make things lighter, trying for a reasonably high F-Rock. The reason why I didn't do much measuring is partly because while it's easy to do, you know, to flick a bridge on the side, as I said earlier, with a plectrum and to, you know, to um, pick it up with a microphone and put it through an FFT program to analyze it, it's much harder to get a repeatable, meaningful measurement. If I put a bridge somehow in a vise and flick it at one point, and then I try it again and I get a, get a different reading, then all those numbers are meaningless. And so it needs to be in a setup that is re repeatable. So for a long time, I was shying away from getting to grips with, with that and just kept to the principles of keeping it strong and fairly light. Then finally, in 2020, Felix Kraft, Andreas Hampel, Bebel Billinghausen and myself, we organized a bridge um, event, five-day event in Berlin at Felix's workshop. And we invited uh, a violinist to help us with our project. We decided on several bridge designs and we selected wood that we were able to measure beforehand. So here you see lots of uncut um, bridge blanks with um, penciled numbers on them. Those are all dimensions and weights. So we were able to calculate the density. We even measured speed of sound with a Lucky meter and all that sort of thing. And once we had selected what we wanted, we had sent them off again to have them routed to our design. So here on the right side, our finished bridge planks, which were the basis for our experiment. On the first day, basically, we fine-tuned our, fine our holding mechanism. 
um, to, to do the measuring. I said earlier that it's a tricky business and it took us, I'm not sure, half a day to a day until we were able to get repeatable results. So here we are still in the process of deciding which kind of vice and what the, the precise microphone position and holding mechanism and all that. So here um, you see Felix's wonderful workshop with stacks of wood. Here again is Felix, Andrea Sampel and Berbel. And we are at this point just reading or putting in all our raw data of the uncut bridge planks as a preparation. So this is the holding mechanism that we ended up using. It's very much based on what I've learned from Joseph Curtin. Um, here this We've got a depth stop at 2.8 millimeters in this case. Uh, it's sort of medium hard wood. And there is a, we've taken into account the taper of the bridge to um, hold it firmly without crushing the feet. Here is the microphone that we place very closely. And this is, we had invited Nathan Giem, at the time concert master of Staatskapelle Dresden, to try all our instruments and bridge variations and to give us his opinion from a player side. And here we all are listening to particular um, comparisons. We all took notes listening. So four listeners plus one player, five different opinions. We all wrote them down and we also recorded every session so we could visit, revisit everything. Now, amongst other things, we compared light and heavy bridges tuned to the same F-Rock. And to nobody's surprise, they sound and work quite differently. I'll just, for those that are, haven't done any bridge tuning, I'll just spell that out. Um, in order to achieve the same F-Rock frequency, I can either leave, leave the, the waist really strong, um, don't do any cutting, and reduce thickness on the top only by a minimum, leave it relatively strong. Or... I can cut the waist to a certain extent and make the top very thin. And I can, can achieve the same F-Rock. But basically, it is, um, I will have a strong and a weak bridge. And to, to distinguish between them, we have their mass as an indication. But indication is the key word here because it remains as vague as that. Because we don't know the precise mass distribution, we cannot really quantify where on the sliding scale between strong and flexible they are. I felt very strongly though that this, is, that this might be an important factor that it would be useful that if we could measure it in order to compare our bridges with each other. So I thought of a way. And here we are with formula. Right, let me spell this out. Um, here is our bridge. We talked earlier about the flexible areas. Here is the waist, and I simplified the model of a violin bridge in which, in the way that 
all the springy areas I mentioned earlier, waist and the thighs and the ankles and the areas between kidneys and heart. I simplified them in my model into one spring, which in my imagination is right here at the waist area. And all the mass of the top part of the violin bridge I imagined not being vaguely or in, in a complicated way distributed. I imagined it all in one point that's right here on the top of the bridge curve in the middle. Now with this simplification, it's much easier to put things into formulas. And the formula for the strength of the bridge, which is really a called a spring constant, abbreviated K. Um, so for that, we can have a formula. So K equals, now this strange W-like looking thing is a lower case omega, which is the angular frequency. Um, we get the angular frequency by just taking our F rock, that's abbreviated here as F1. Uh, if we multiply that by 2 pi, then we've got omega 1. So basically, this is just a different way of writing our frequency. And we square this, and we multiply it with our effective mass that we've got here. So that's great. We've got a formula for it. Unfortunately, we've got we want to know this, we know this, but we also don't know this. So we've got too many unknowns and can't solve it. Until we go to the next slide. So here on the left side is exactly what you've just seen in the previous slide. But here on the right side is a slight difference. Um, the difference being that I've put a real life weight in the exact spot where I've defined the effective mass. And since it's a, leaf, a, a real life weight or mass, I do know the precise mass of it. And in a similar way, as I calculate, um, yeah, one more point, by do, putting on this mass, I did not change the spring constant or the strength of the bridge in any way. So because that is the same, we can equate these two things. Here on the right side, we've basically got a way of writing the frequency f rock with the weight, with the added mass. And instead of just m1, the effective mass, we've got the effective mass plus the extra weight x. So this has to be equal to that. And with a bit of algebra that I will spare you, and it was a lot more effort for me than it was for some other people, we end up with two formulae. The effective mass m1 is a product of, well, um, omega 2 squared times x. Well, I stay reading it out. You can see what the formula looks like. We've got, we know the, uh, omega 2, we know x, we know omega 1, and we know omega 2 again. So we've, these are all known factors. And down here, the same, the like spring constant k, and what we've got on the right side is all things we know and can measure. So suddenly we can put all this in our database and calculate it. Now, last week when I, was, when I presented this to some experts, I learned that having the effective mass and the spring constant, we can also easily calculate the impedance of the bridge at rocking mode fre frequency. And that this might be a useful number to include in my spreadsheet. 
So here we are. Um, now, just have to look at that again. The mechanical impedance, looked it up, is defined as a measure of how much a structure resists to motion when subjected to a harmonic force. And it sounds like it should actually um, be quite important how much the bridge resists the vibration from the strings. Okay. No. Let's see, here comes the next slide. Before I start the video, here is the video um, of me doing the actual measurement. Now, I've made this video a little time ago, and as you see, the bridge is held in a different device. This is a device I tried in the meantime and that kind of works, but it does deliver slightly different numbers from when I do the same measurement in the vise that I showed you earlier. So I've kind of gone away from holding it in this device. For the measurement, uh, for, for the purposes of this video, it makes no difference. But it does make a difference once we are starting to compare our numbers with each other. So um, that's really a subject we need to talk about later um, so we can have meaningful numbers. One more point that I uh, want to make before I show the video. So far we've only take, uh, talked about in-plane resonances where the, well, basically, where the bridge does this, but there are also out-of-plane resonances. So if you imagine it bending like this. While the in-plane resonances are very clear and um, I think nobody disagrees much um, that they are very important. It's very debatable or um, whether the out-of-plane resonances are important or in which way they are important if they are. I've included them here in my measurement, in my measurement routine. Um, we can talk about it later, but um, just making the point, this is why they're in here. And now I'll play, play the video. It will be just under three minutes long. And apparently it's not so loud. Um, the, me talking, if you don't hear everything, it's not really that crucial. Um, I can explain later if you haven't heard. Now I'll play it. In order to calculate my spring constant, I take four frequency measurements, starting with the first in-play and resonance. Two thousand nine hundred and forty-seven, which I put into my database. Then I move to the out-of-plane resonance. Six hundred and twenty-seven. Which I, again, I put into my database. Now I have a weight at the top of my bridge. I cut a piece of double-sided tape. I glued to the top of the bridge. I then take a 
brass weight which I have bent to the bridge curve which weighs exactly 0.25 of a gram. And now take the out of plane resonance again. Four hundred and eighty two. Put it into my database. And now, for the last time, I take the in plane resonance, but now with the weight of a quarter of a gram. So now I'll come down. 2,554. Now this shows me, it calculates automatically my spring constant, in this case of 259 uh, in plane and 5.61 out of plane. Right. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, good. So this is how I measure it. It's fairly simple. And it only takes, well, about twice as long as measuring FROC by itself. So it's a little added um, time but not actually all that much once you've once you're set up um, to measure Afrock, it's only a, a small extra effort oh hang on i need to get the next slide not again hang on how would i get to the next ah here we go right so what? We've got all these numbers and doing all this measuring. Why do I make all that effort? Is it just to satisfy my said need to fill a, a spreadsheet? Um, clearly by themselves, these numbers don't make better bridges. But I believe that when you cut bridges and you measure them as described, and you try them on the instruments, and you note down your judgment, and then you cut some, cut some more, and we've got a strong tool in our hands to learn to cut better bridges. We basically relate what we're hearing to the numbers we're measuring, and that gives us good indications for the next bridge. And sometimes we might sacrifice a bridge by going further than we think might be right but we just want to try try more go go lower in frequencies or in flexibility or in um and in order to find the best point for a particular instrument and if we keep track with numbers in in a spreadsheet with our comments, then of course we can look back and see, well, in hindsight, it was best at this point when it had well, this spring constant or, the, or this impedance or whatever. So I think it's a strong tool if we use it right. Um, we can also maybe discover um, whether there are some of the numbers that best suit soloists and some other numbers that work best for chamber music players or different kind of players. Um, I think if we use them right, there is quite a big potential um, and a better way of, of tracking our studying. So I use this method as well to measure bridges that come to my workshop on customer instruments just to analyze what other people and workshops are doing. It lets you deal with a bridge plank with different wood to what you're used to. And for me, it's just another piece of the puzzle bridge that for all we know, we, 
will be never complete. This 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 bridge business is is such a complicated um, business that we'll never understand uh, the last aspects of it. But if we can just understand a little more and um, predict it a bit more, well, it will help us um, to make better sounding uh, setups and yeah, which is the aim. Okay, what else? So this was the main part of my talk. There are a few areas that I've only touched on. I've briefly mentioned the out of plane spring constant. This is where I had, a, as a maker, a strong instinct that actually it's something that seems to be important. Just when I change the thickness and the flexibility of a bridge, that I get a different response. Now, I've had very clear doubts from the physical from the acousticians and I think their thought is that everything that I, I thought I changed in the out of plane direction also influences the in plane parameters which of course is right um, I think we will we will just have to um, try with some well designed experiments whether we can decide whether um, it is just this in plane um, influence that's important or whether there is something else that we have missed so far. Um, I think it's it's very exciting to to work on that and. I don't really mind which way it goes, but I'm, I'm curious to find out. The other thing is the bouncing mode. Joseph Curtin has quite rightly um, pointed out that until now, we've only looked at our rocking mode which is around about 3,000 plus hertz. We all, there is also another mode that's around about the 6,000 hertz, which kind of looks a little bit like this, I believe. That's also believed to be, to have quite a reasonably important influence on the sound. At the moment, we haven't found an easy way to measure that in the vise, just because there are so many modes flying about that it's hard to isolate that and be sure that we're measuring the, the right mode. I think maybe later we can talk about that. George Stopani was thinking of using a, a phono pickup, um, whether that might be a way of identifying it and measuring it. If we could add that, um, if we could measure that securely, then I can't see a reason why we couldn't apply the same principle with the added weight to um, measure the spring constant of that mode, which would be slightly different or different full stop. One more point here. Um, my colleague um, Andreas Hampel, that you've seen in the pictures of our Berlin um, experiment earlier, he's been working on his own on the idea of how to get to grips with this strength of a bridge. Um, I've agreed to report with, with, I've agreed with him to report to you his thoughts and his approach. Uh, they're separate from mine, but use a lot of the same underlying formula. 
So his, so he doesn't use a weight that you put on top. He just uses basically the original F rock that a lot of people are already measuring. Now he made an observation that I have not tried and can't verify. Basically, he's sacrificed a few bridges, thinking about some bridge, bridges with here old-fashioned bridges with a low waist, and here comparison with a high wa waist. So you've got more or less the same height, 32.8 and 32.9 on these bridges. I think these are specific bridges he's measured. And here you've got the waist at a height of 11.9 and here at 13.4. So you've got different proportions above the waist. What he has, when he cut through the bridges at this precise point, he seemed to, he measured exactly the weight of the top and the bottom. And he found that the respective weights to each other are very much in proportion to the top half to the whole. Basically, the, the top height to the whole height would be very close to the top weight to the whole weight. Suppose this is explained roughly by despite the bridge getting much thinner at the top, it also gets wider, which, as he feels, cancelled each other out fairly um, well. Now, this is clearly a very good estimate, but not a measurement. And, you know, as soon as you cut out something here or take something away here, this will no longer be precise, but he found it was a good estimate. If you take that estimate, then basically here on the right side, here we've got those ratios, the height above the waist, um, above the total height, so you've got the proportion. You multiply that with the total weight, and with that you've got an estimate of the top the, the mass the mass of the top half and basically he's using the same underlying formula of the spring constant he uses d instead of k and he also um, leaves out the two pi um, that we had in the angular frequency but otherwise it's the same formula so he calculates his special um, constant like that um, as a measure of the stiffness of the bridge. I find it can be useful to have this estimate, especially uh, maybe if you've got bridges that are all cut the same in the same style and you want to check, or you've got da data of the past where you've got the um, rocking mode frequency, but you can no longer go and measure it again with an added weight. So I think um, it can be interesting to compare this. Um, for my part, I want to have it in my spreadsheet, and just after many, many bridges to be that I'm measuring in my way, then I can compare with how much in parallel or not this estimate um, is with, with my actual measurements. And this, I believe, is all um, of the talk. Now, I do want to mention again the important point of um, maybe once we've discussed some more principles, I don't know whether there are some questions about the idea of it all. Um, but once we've discussed that, I think the most important thing would be to discuss the holding me mechanism because 
I would say the whole exercise is meaningless if our measurements are not consistent and they would be a lot more meaningful if actually our ways of measuring it are actually comparable with, with each other. If I could be sure that if I measured a particular bridge and what my measurements, um, the numbers I get, that they're the same as if I sent the same bridge to Joseph Curtin or somebody else around the world, um, unless we get similar numbers, we can't really talk to each other uh, and say, well, you know, my, my experience is that if you go below 3,000 hertz, you lose a certain something. Um, unless we've got the same numbers, um, that conversation is also meaningless. So I think that's a, a absolutely crucial point, is that we are reasonably close with our measurements. And I was astonished how different results you can get when you clamp uh, the bridge just slightly differently. One thought that I had, and I'm sure maybe other people will have different ideas, um, is whether somebody could design on CAD um, very, you know, precise sort of inner jaws to be put into a vice. And that could be 3D printed and would be the same for everybody. And we'd, we would just send it round and everybody lines their own vice with the same jaws, something like that. Or, or we get it CNC'd out of wood or something like that. that but that's something to be discussed. Um, but now I think I've finished and I'm happy for any questions and I'll stop sharing. All right. Thank you so much, Andreas. Wonderful presentation. And as all really good presentations, it raises more questions. So um, the floor is now open for questions. Please use the, uh, um, I forgot, what was it? Uh, it's in the uh, reactions, um, a mic app, the raise hand feature if you want to ask a question. Joseph. Um, thank you, Andreas. That was really wonderful. I really appreciate your serious approach to this and the way you've um, I've laid it out. The question I want to know is, so what are typical string contents and what, what are the units you're measuring in? I mean, stiffness is usually what deflection per unit force. So can you give us some numbers and how they vary from bridge to bridge? Right, I better look in my spreadsheet. Um, in terms of units, quite honestly, I'm not sure I have been bothering with units. It's a very big number, which I divided um, by 10,000 to make it um, more manageable. So um, what I have in my spreadsheet, well, they go from the re really weak bridges from 186, I see, but I've got a really strong bridge here with 327. So uh, just by comparing those two numbers, um, that is an enormous difference. Um, a lot of bridges are between 200 or maybe between 210 and 260 or so. Um, maybe the physicists can tell me what actual um, unit that is. I have no idea, to be honest. That is. <laughs> I can answer that one if you like. It's the, the, the way you've used the formulae. It's exactly what Joseph said. It's force pay force per distance, newtons per meter. And spring constants always are very big numbers, so that's quite reassuring. <laughs> um, I'm glad. Um, but I just found it more manageable, um, divided um, by 10,000, so uh, it's a number I can... Um, 
The, the only comment on that, saying. if you wanted to be conventional, then 10,000 people usually do go in, in, in um, powers of 10 in threes. So if you did 1,000, you'd be in killer something or others. If you did, oh, hang on. If you did a million, you'd be mega something or others. Oh, hang on. Uh, if you're 10,000... Uh, I think you're four. actually right. Actually, I think... Uh, hang on. It, it was actually a million I did, so... Um, okay, so they're, 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 they're okay, me just gave you the mega things. Mega, mega newtons per meter, that's what your units are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I can, I can uh, uh, verify that because I have the spreadsheet open, and, and he does divide by uh, ten, uh, one million. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Joseph? Um, no, no, that's... Um... That's fine. Well, I always um, would like to say, okay, so let me get a, a strip of maple that I can flex that has some of those numbers just to have a, an instinct for what they are. Um, but that's just my own curiosity. Um, All right. Try it out and measure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, sh I will, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Uh, Tom Crone. Hey, <clears throat> hi, Andreas. <laughs> hi, Tom. Good to see you. Likewise. Um, you know, you were raising questions about your holding device. And um, we found when we did some work on fingerboards in 2019 at the workshop, Joe had a large block that he used to hold his fingerboard when we were tapping the extension of the fingerboard. And I had a smaller block and we got different numbers. And it seemed like the mass of the block was relevant as well as how much clamping pressure we used. So, um, you know, it's a complicated thing to get that totally consistent measurement, um, you know, from every individual who's doing this sort of work themselves. Um, certainly the trends are relevant, but the, um, the actual numbers can be really tricky to uh, pin down. Just an observation. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need to be super, you know, concerned about a few hertz here and there. But once we're talking, you know, differences of of 100 or 200 hertz, then there, there comes a point that our discussions, if we, we kind of say, you know, what's your cutoff frequency? What do you go for? Yeah. And for the same bridge, I would be measuring 3,200 and you're measuring 3,400. Then our discussion is kind of starting to be meaningless. Yes. Um, we, we don't know whether we've got different taste or whether we're just measuring differently. Oh, I just had an idea. Um, what if there was a way of <laughs> calibrating the thing? So you have some object that you put in the vise and squeeze it and you zero at that, you know, that amount of pressure. And then you recreate that pressure. You know, each individual will sort of calibrate to that zero point. I don't quite have it in my mind, but, you know, some way of uh, establishing that in each individual place. So you can sort of account for the differences. I think a starting point would be that we um, agree on exactly which part, how big a part of the um, bridge foot is actually in the jaws. That would be sort of the most fundamental uh, thing to agree. Just looking, finding these pictures from Oberlin 2004, suddenly I zoomed in and realized, oh, um, actually they're less far in than what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. And I'm, then I had a look, uh, we looked again at the Strad article that Joseph Curtin wrote, was it? two years ago, November 19, I believe it was. And then there was a close-up, and that looked, again, different from what I am having. 
there are subtle enough differences, but there are differences. And I think there was also different material. I believe Joseph used what looked like ebony. I've got, I think it's pear wood or so, something medium, you know, softer than, um, my thinking was softer than maple. So, um, but hard enough to be not squishy. Yeah. But, you know, again, the material would be, we should be reasonably uh, comparable. I think there are a few things, you know, I don't think anything is right or wrong, but if we make them similar enough, then we've got a much better basis. And then we're coming to the point where it's, okay, how, how, how strongly do we um, um, squeeze that, um, uh, um, you know, how, how tight do we make it? What I found um, around the Berlin project time is that, you know, there was this bar, and, you know, I can, you can put a lot of pressure on it <laughs> quite easily. Um, and yes, the, the, the harder you, you, the more you turn, the higher the frequency. Yeah. What I ended up doing is I, um, I took the bar away and I put a, hang on, I can show this with my camera. But actually, I just should hold this up. There, here's the device. And I put this, um, turned this wooden thing. So with a diameter, it's, I think it's just over three centimeters. And I found it easier. It was completely just with a with small diameter um, metal bit inside. It wasn't quite enough for hand pressure tightening. With the bar through it, it was kind of too much and I could easily squeeze too much. I found this quite easy. I could I found an easy way of saying, okay, this is tight, but not squashing it. That's what I did for myself. Um, but of course, that's not exactly calibrated. Um, uh, what feels just right to me might, um, a stronger person <laughs> might make it a lot tighter um, with the same definition. Um, Andreas, can I cut in? Because there's a question that was in the chat um, um, about the clamping force and how that affects it. So, so related to that, when you say that, you know, you felt it was too tight or not tight, um, how could you tell that it was not, it was too tight or not tight enough? What, what are you going by? Well, the, uh, not tight enough is easier because it's, it's when you get the feeling that actually when you're flicking upwards, it's, it's moving. It's moving. Um, um, and then there comes the point where you want, you know, the bridge is not completely um, perfect in shape. Some bridges are slightly shaped anyway, um, as others are completely parallel. There is a certain slack that I think we need to take up with slightly soft wood so that we, we if we press those um, surfaces together that um, we have a big enough surface area that is uh, in contact. So I, I think this is probably where where this is coming from that if you um, tighten it a little more you get a higher um, frequency and possibly also a bit of a, a clearer um, resonance. Um, showing up on the FFT just because, you know, it's it's a clear cutoff point of what's moving and what's not moving. And obviously, you don't want to make it so tight um, that you squash the bridge foot. Um, it's not not only good for the um, measurement, but you might also uh, not be able to put the bridge on another violin. Oh, sorry, I, I think I might have lost the uh, video there. Um, Tom, are you, Tom Crone, are you, uh, any more questions? Oh, oh no, I, um, sorry, I didn't lower my. Okay, my all right. <laughs> so let's go to uh, Tom King. Um, 
Okay, thanks. Andreas, thanks so much for your presentation. That was really well done. Um, I just had two comments and questions. One is when I measure the bridges, um, I usually just use a small impact hammer to tap on the, on the base side of the bridge. And I always pick up those the, the, the three modes, the, the one around 600, one around 17 or 18, and the one around 3,000. I'm assuming that the two lower ones are, are the out-of-plane um, uh, resonances. And a question would be, do you or anybody else here uh, have a nice diagram of what those out-of-plane resonances look like? You know, we have from a long, long time ago some, some little pictures that Oliver Rogers did in the CatGut article, but I don't think he did anything comparable for the out-of-plane uh, motions, and I think it would be interesting uh, to, to see that. So that's, that's my, my question comment. I'm afraid I don't have any material or research in what they look like. Oh, I've done the very, very simplest. I've plucked, I've basically left the bridge clamped the same way as I had for the in-plane mode and just plucked the other way. And one of the really obvious, um, I took the lowest frequency, which was very clear. Uh, and I thought this would be worth comparing, but I have not looked into or found material um, in exactly what this movement of that node looks like. Uh, would be really interesting to have that, but I'm afraid I haven't got the answer. There are images out there. I think George Bissinger might have done a series and included in our Oberlin one year fan, do you remember? Um, and I think someone else did some, I think there's some online, I'll try and find them. Um, Sam, um, I think he had some images. Sam, are you are you here? Do you do you remember where there's a source of animations for the bridge modes? Um, I, I could actually post them somewhere. I, I know that um, that George did do uh, laser test animations of bridges on violins. What's interesting about them to me, um, and I think George Stepani has independently created um, animations of bridges on violins, is that. The modes of the act on the violin don't look that much like the, we think the bridge just clamped in a vice looks like. They're all they were often little bits of the modes combined in different ways. Hmm. Oh. Uh, Joseph, you're mu muted. So, so these aren't clamped modes. These are images of the violin on the bridge, which is very Yes, in fact, uh, Dr. Bissinger's uh, animations include uh, the, the uh, island, the cross-section of the island with the uh, other. Mm. All right. Thank you. Um, Jim. Just a, <clears throat> just a really simple follow-up on the previous, the, the question before last. Um, it, it's <clears throat> about how do we know whether we're measuring the same thing. Now, if there's a group of people that are interested in doing this, and it seems like a neat idea. Now, Andreas already suggested that you might make some kind of universal vice liners that people use. If you're going to do that and distribute something, then there's a really easy way to deal with the other thing. You, you, you make a, a bridge, probably not a wooden one, so, yeah, but you, you, if you made a bridge shape, um, also 3D printed or cut out of polycarbonate or something which could be made accurately the same then while you're posting people their vice jaws you send them the standard bridge and then Andrea sends it with a little leaflet saying adjust your clamping method until you get the number 2452 <laughs> and then you're doing the same as everyone else that would um my experience is 3D printing wouldn't be nearly consistent enough, but I love the idea of a standard yeah. bridge that could no, be shipped not, around. Not 3D printing. I think I think you're right there. But probably you get your bridge cutting. I mean, you 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 talk to the people that you you showed us. You you started with blanks and then sent them away to be cut. 
um, you could probably talk nicely to them if they're doing water jet cutting or something. It would work perfectly well in some kind of polymer sheet or metal. Polymer would be in the same area as wood. You could probably get universal shapes cut out of some standardized engineering material that comes in sheets and just send everyone one with their vice jaws. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, I think. Now, the big question is, who is good at um, CAD designing um, and, <laughs> and which design is it going to be? Um, I've not done any CAD designing and um, probably not about to start from zero. Um, it doesn't matter in the least for this. If you could get a bridge manufacturer to do them for you, they can just use their standard pattern. They just press the button on their standard cutter no, but, but, but for the for the for the uh, jaw design. Oh, the jaw I suppose, design. I suppose if we had one jaw design that was well executed, we could um, uh, just scan it in and um, have it reproduced, or somebody could um, take something and design it, uh, which would mean we don't have the flaws of the first um, handmade one. Uh, re reproduced. I, I we have the. I mean, we can do the um, CAD, CAD work at, at my shop. I think we have to. It is a more of a project than one wants it to be. Um, and I think you have to decide first of all what's your reference. And um, tell me, tell me all if you agree. I think what we'd want to do is take an actual bridge and glue the feet down to a perfectly fitted large mass. And that would be the standard. Um, and then we'd want to design a, a jig that'll get that. Um, does that sound reasonable? Um, yes. Let me just show you something. Just out of interest, last week we talked about this, and I was um, talking about... Um, sort of discrepancies some schools of um, bridge feet cutting there is a, a bit of a curve on the front and others are completely parallel which of course causes a slight problem you either have to you know make the front jaw you know straight or slightly curved in order to have the optimal um, shape now, what I have done, now, can you see this? I've put these round inserts in there that swivel just slightly. Mm. And nice. uh, it was quite a lot of work. And it didn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, part of why it didn't work might be still that despite putting quite a bit of time it is still not quite precise enough and i didn't have a lathe so i needed to do some hand fitting and stuff but before i finished it, even before i knew whether it would work or not i found that even if it had worked that it was actually so much work that i would not get anybody else to replicate it so it would still not be comparable <laughs> Um, I just feel this might have been a little bit too complicated, but um, this is just, um, yeah, that's just a side issue. Now back, Joseph, to your definition um, of it being glued. Um, are you at the moment using a, a curved top or a straight top? Uh, sorry, I mean that in in this direction so are you the outer of your feet further down in the jaw than the inner of your feet or or is the are they, they the inner of your feet still how, how do you currently have it let me just let me just grab my plan can i offer an idea yes um just while we were talking, I drew this. And if it was a uniform piece of plastic, 
of, you know, polycarbonate or whatever, anybody could make a piece that size. And then with the clamping pressure, sort of determine where that clamping pressure is sort of calibrated to some kind of agreed standard. Because be easy would enough. You, would you be measuring out of plane or in plane? Well, I'm guessing in plane, you know. Okay, rocking. in which case we probably would want to, uh, I mean, if it's without any recesses, that would be very hard to get an in plane motion. Uh, right. We probably won't want, want to narrow some kind of a waste. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it would, would be easy enough to do. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, I use a, a slightly curved upper surface, so it's um, kind of going along with the foot and some little brass things that the feet sit on, so they go in a defined depth, let's say two millimeters down. Um, but I'm not, I, I'm always shocked by how much um, uncertainty there is, and partly because a lot of the out of plane modes, they have such bigger amplitude than the, the one we're looking for. You, you, it can kind of swamp things. Um, so I would actually like to spend some time um, getting to the bottom of this, and maybe we could have a little Zoom group for developing a fixture that we all find work. But let me ask, um, let me ask Jim, um, as a physicist, I mean, when we have a clamped foot, do we mean clamped with no hinge? Is that is in your model, Jim? Is that what it, what we're looking at? So we're a completely rigid clamping across the bridge feet. Yeah, probably. That that that's the cleanest thing to aim for, and it's intrinsically hard to do. Um, and actually, one of the things you would definitely want to if you if you're lining your vice with something a little bit soft keep it as thin as possible because that's another spring you're putting in then the, the thicker you make your piece of plastic in your vice the softer the spring on the feet and you're self-defeating it's just half a millimeter you know just something just enough to take up the stuff you're talking about but the closer you are to having metal on the feet with something that to locate the feet correctly the more likely you are to you know, that that's um, the other simple thing to say, which is kind of obvious, is that the the weaker your bridge, the easier it is to do the measurements. The stiffer the bridge you're trying to measure, the more it's going to be influenced by a bit of extra springiness in the way you've clamped it. So it's always going to be a, a super thin, super bendy bridge. Um, any clamping will give essentially the same answer. The place you're going to get this inconsistency amplified is when you when you take a the, a stiff one, an uncut blank. You know, the, the stiffest thing the bridge maker allows you to do. That's going to be the challenge. But keep it thin, keep it solid. Okay. Um, at this point, I want to go back to a question that was submitted in the chat um, quite a while ago. Um, and maybe, Jim, you might want to address this. Does the method of exciting the bridge matter a lot when you measure? Just wondering whether the fingernail click shown in the video versus a more standardized method would matter. No. That, that's a, unusually a question with an easy answer. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, can, I, can I come in? Yes. Um, um, just that. Yeah, and that, that's not necessarily so for as far as the measurement is concerned. Tapping the bridge in plane, for example, um, excites mostly the in plane resonances. When you clip it like that, you're sure going to excite some of the outer plane resonances. If you're really interested mostly in the in plane resonance, I think that the tap on the bridge with a little hammer or a pencil or whatever you do. Um, just to tap it in plane um, is more likely to give you um, clean results. Yeah, just to be clear, I, I agree. My, my my definitive no was do the frequencies care, and no, the frequencies don't care. But yes, you've got to you've got to better see the frequency you're looking for. There's no doubt about exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Just just to summarize for the rest of the group, what Jim and Colin are saying is that the the method of excitation. Um, it should not matter to the frequencies, but if you're exciting certain other 
modes much more strongly, it may interfere with your ability to see the mode that you actually want to see. So, so in practice, the method of excitation could matter a lot. <laughs> There's something I learned from, from Sam I thought was very good is um, he gives it a pluck halfway between in-plane and out-of-plane, and you get all the modes there, and you want to know where all the modes are and count them so you know, so you know where they are, and then you can say, okay, this is the one I'm interested in, and then you can excite that more carefully. I, I really like that approach. And yep. even so when you have the mode you want, I will often add a tiny bit of mass on top. And if that mode doesn't move, then it's not the one I want. You're just, you know, poking around at things and trying to make sure you're, you're measuring what you think you are, I think is important. Yeah, yeah Colin. Uh, right. Uh, as an experimentalist, as well as thinking about things, I find it extreme. I really don't understand why pressure, um, for example, or on sideways pressure, on the feet of the bridge makes all this much difference. It seems to me, so um, going back to really fundamentals, that um, if you are mostly interested in the in-plane resonances, um, uh, uh, then um, what you're actually measuring in the rocking is actually a torsional motion of the top of the bridge with its moment of inertia being restrained by the spring motion of a, of, a, of a torsional spring. And the moment of inertia, in fact, depends, in fact, on the mass times the height, and the height squared, in fact. And so that if you're looking for a, a Hampel-type function that's a, about a bridge, I would have thought um, putting the um, a small mass on the top of the bridge measuring the effective um, mass is fine because that, that's, that's giving you something definite. But in practice, it, it also, it, what happens in terms of the, the bridge when it's acting on something is it's, it's a torsional motion that excites the, eventually the, the modes of the, of the bridge, uh, of the, the top plate. And there, what you want to actually, if, if for a rigid bit, you want something to really stop things really going up and down, as it were, on the, on the feet of the bridge. So why, why, don't, why do you not, in fact, um, use the gluing technique to a really subject, solid object? Because rather than clamping sideways, it seems more, I, I know you've got to adjust things, but if, certainly if you make bridges of always the same sort of size um, and shape, um, uh, that then you, uh, you, you could have a, a block of wood or something that you carve carefully um, and match in the same way that you match to the normal um, uh, arching uh, of a violin and just glue it on. And using a glue that you can take on and off very easily with heat or something like that um, would give you a very simple way to, I would have thought, give reproducible results. Um... I find it hard to see how I can take a customer's bridge or even from my own violin, glue it to something and then put it back on the bridge, uh, on the violin afterwards. Um, that kind of might be difficult in a workshop situation. For an experiment, I can kind of see that um, in a workshop, con workshop context, uh, right. I can't, can't really see that. I think the gist of what you're doing, clamping the ankles, seems exactly right. And if I'm understanding, Colin's, Colin's saying, why does the clamping pressure make a difference? And it, it, it's, it is all to do with the fact that there's a little bit of extra springiness associated with the way you're clamping it, um, particularly to do with the fact that the surface of the wood is not, even if it's nominally parallel, it'll be slightly rough. And uh, you, you need to squash those things flat. Otherwise, you've got an extra little bit of stiffness, floppiness coming from the fact that you've got little microscopic lumps and bumps on the surface of the wood. And you don't care about those. You're just trying to get rid of them in the cleanest possible way. So uh, the, the really, I stick with what I said before, the thinnest lining yeah. that, um, that, that gets you closest to metal against wood but just protecting enough and, and taking up the little bit of 
shape. Can, can, can you take tamp, um, um, tapered veneers, for example, uh, and put, put them in with, uh, and you can easily taper different um, slopes and, and put them in to get a good fitting that way? Ah, you mean if some bridges are straight and some are tapered, then you could counteract yes. on the tapered ones? Yeah. Uh, yes, I suppose that's a possibility. You have to be very precise and get them in the right place. That might be the, the challenge. Well, the challenge, but, the challenge is if you can do it reproducibly, reproducibly on a single bridge by taking on and off, and finding out what pressure does there, that might, that might give you an indication of whether that would work. Yeah. I just wonder, has anybody tried? So far, whatever I've seen, um, the material was some kind of wood, hard or, or softer sometimes. Um, since we're actually trying to, to stop movement um, without squashing too much, um, what if we lined also um, if we lined the uh, the jaws with fine sandpaper? Um, you know something like six hundred grit or four hundred grit um, that doesn't leave lots of little pock mark, uh, uh, marks in 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 the surface, but nevertheless has well has a lot of friction built in. Would that be a possibility, or do you think that's a stupid idea? No. Any you should try it. <laughs> do try the experiment. It. Yeah. Yeah, try it. Yeah, try it. <laughs> and then tell us what the answer is. <laughs> right. <laughs> can, can I go back to what the, the other point that I made about yeah. it being a rotational motion that involves the moment of inertia? Now, uh, um, uh, uh, Andrea, um, uh, your method of putting the mass on top is fine. This it gives you an effective mass, as you quite rightly said. But that effective mass depends, in fact, on the height of the um, distance above the waist and the shape. Uh, and generally, of course, you have a, a tapered surface. And so it depends, in fact, on the tapered, tapered distribution of mass. So it does depend on quite a lot of things, but it certainly depends on height. Um, and therefore, um, instead of uh, 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 an extra thing that you could consider to be important would be that the um, height of the uh, uh, bridge above the waist area squared times the mass because that, 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 that has the dimensions of, of inertia, moments of inertia. And uh, um, rather than just mass alone, fine if you're always using uh, of the same height, but um, if you, if for example, you put your mass on, on, a, on something that was much further away from the waist, you would find it had much more effect. In fact, if it was on a rigid support, so it, um, my, I would suggest, in fact, that um, the other Andres might use uh, as a, another um, measure, as it were, um, like his constant. The, the mass times the height above the bridge, uh, the height above the waist, top of the bridge to the, to the waist. So you're saying this would not apply to my constant, but only to the Andrea Sample constant. No, it's, a, right? it's, another, it's another constant. No, no, your constant's fine. It's an effective okay. mass. Yes. Um, um, I'm saying where, where that effective mass actually, actually in, involves the, the, the thickness distribution of the top of the bridge, um, and it depends really on the square of that. So you, you will be, start getting out a different constant um, in terms of the coupling in a sense, because you're measuring, but, but there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. But, uh, but if you want to, to, to know something, what's going to affect that effective mass, um, the, 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 height, the height squared for a given geometry um, uh, and mass is what's important, I believe. Now, now, Jim can correct me if I'm wrong. It's correct, but I don't think it matters. 
you know, Andreas's effective mass is, is, is roughly where the two middle strings are, and they're also affected by the height in much the same way. So his measurement is a kind I, I, of effective I, I, linear stiffness at the position of the middle strings. That seems I, all right. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm agree entirely what Andreas is doing. I'm talking about um, something that affects the effective mass. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just make a comment because if, if Andreas is um, taking um, good notes on the basic dimensions of the bridge, then this can be analyzed afterwards, you know, with his data sets. Anybody exactly. else can, exactly. can analyze it if they want to. <laughs> um, and we've had some people who've had their hands up for a long time. Um, yeah, yeah. This, um, yeah, we can go back to some of these, uh, you know, um, Colin, if you have more comments later. But let, yeah, let's get to. Uh, Jonas. Yeah, I'll take my thing down. Yeah, so um, I think my comment is quite similar to what uh, Colin just said, namely that I would like, since we're talking about being able to compare measurements, like in different workshops and different bridges, that I would be concerned that these spring constants and masses are actually effective masses and spring constants. They are not actual masses and spring constants. And so um, I was just wondering whether, whether or not probably, possibly the fundamental quantity that we are actually interested in is the impedance. And how, how difficult would it be to, to change this measurement to be an impedance measurement instead of a measurement of these sort of effective? Um, it's um, the, I have, the, the impedance is very easily calculated. In my talk, I think I've had one slide with a with a formula, which I was <laughs> I've only learned last last week from from Jim. Um, I think Colin mentioned it as well. Um, so by having the uh, spring constant and the effective mass, um, I think it was the square root of the product of the two. Um, so basically, it was very easy to put that into my database. On the on the little video, uh, you've seen the old version of the database in the new or in the spreadsheet. In the new version, you immediately see next to each other um, both spring constant, then effective mass, and then the impedance. They just pop up next to each other, and you can just read it like that. Yeah, but I, th I think my concern was more along the lines that Colin mentioned that actually the results you get. Are sensitive to where you put your mass. How far? How? What is the distance between the axis of rotation and where you put the mass? Right. So that would be like I think those effective numbers could be um, uh, dependent on the design of the bridge and stuff like that. Which would mean that it. I mean, to me, it just seems it would be weird to try to compare numbers across a lot of different bridge designs. So that would be my concern. Um, but may, maybe it is not sensitive at all. I'm maybe uh, my thought, and uh, please, the physicists tell me whether I'm right or wrong. I would have thought since I defined the effective mass to be at the top edge where the strings are. I mean, obviously, the four strings are in four different positions, but they're as close to each other you know this similar distance as as can be done um that whether it's higher if my 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 distance from from the from the spring is is is, is bigger um that's compensated for because the, the, the distance of the strings to the same point the um the spring is also bigger um so i'm actually still measuring what's what's important but I might be missing something and um, be happy if, if uh, I'm, I'm being corrected by the physicists here. Yeah. Uh, Jim <laughs> seems to agree with Andreas, although I don't know if Colin is uh, shaking his head or... But you're no, muted, I, I, Colin. I, I, was, I was agreeing, but I, oh, turned, okay. I muted myself. Oh, okay. So, so the physicists agree with you that, okay, that because that's where the me. strings are. Um, mm -hmm. And so. it, it, it would be interesting, of course, just to confirm that you could easily do so by putting your extra mass 
on uh, the outside edges of the, of the bridge, the top and base and travel sides, and seeing if you get the same results. Uh, well, very, well very, very I think you get very, very similar results. Yeah, Collins, but I think you're getting into another issue here, which is that we, we do know that the transfer response from, you know, one side of the bridge to the other side of the bridge is not the same. Well, you, you, uh, yes, but the effective mass might be parallel to the bridge mm -hmm. because it's a curved surface. And as you're saying, if it's it, it, it's the couple, the, the, the exciting things, um, the, it's the force times the, the distance um, squared sort of thing, the mm -hmm. um, force times distance rather, sorry. I, I think the answer to that one is that it's, it all depends where the center of rotation of this bridge mode is. Yeah. If it happens to be at the center of the circle, which is the bridge top curve, then you can put your mass near any of the springs and they will definitely all be the same. Well, it's not very far away from that geometric center, so I would well, expect that it wouldn't matter very much. I agree. Actually, it is quite far away. Okay. Um, and the, the lower your bridge, um, the worse it becomes. Oh. If you had a very high bridge, it might approach it. With a typical bridge, I think Cullen's right, it would, you'd get a different number because you're getting more leverage at the edges. Um, but I... I I don't know. It still worries me that you could have two bridges with the same effective mass and stiffness and frequency, et cetera, but be different heights. And those, we'd all agree, are different bridges. So there is something to do with the height in there. But of course, you can just record the height, then you know that. We're only trying to get guidelines, I think, for, for shop use. But, but, but the height is another variable. Yes. And, yeah. and I don't know, I mean, just from makers out there, um, I think everyone agrees that height's a very important variable. I, I, I certainly think of it as one. Yeah. Andrew? Um, I actually, well, let's see. You want, uh, because uh, Sam has had his hands up, but then uh, uh, nowhere to be seen. So let's go to Andrew. Oh, wait a minute. Here comes Sam. Uh, yeah. Unmute. Yes. Hello. Um, super interesting project. Uh, I, of course, it's my duty to try to bring this back to the world of violins. You did, a, you experimented on many instruments, and uh, I believe, if I understood what you said in our last conversation, that in general you were preferring the bridges that were lighter weight and presumably a little less stiff. Um, are there circumstances where you would, where you felt like the uh, the heavier, stiffer bridge was preferable, or was it always in the lighter direction that you wound up settling? So far. I don't think I found, I, I like the, the lighter, more flexible ones. You know, the, of, of course comes a cutoff point where too flexible, um, you know, uh, might be problematic. I haven't gone beyond to really f feel, okay, uh, the boundaries. I think that would be actually a, a, a great project for a group of people, uh, you know, working downwards, maybe with several bridges that are similar, and working some beyond where we usually would think it's sensible, and just to, to really explore um, the boundaries of wh where, um, you know, where does it suddenly start getting really terrible. Yeah. But, you know, uh, re recording it in, in a number of steps. And in uh, just your experience, are there are there specific bridge cutting variations that you find yourself called to use in different circumstances, or have you basically just been evolving your bridge in a, a, what you consider a positive way? I I'm not that far yet. Basically, I've sort of my my bridges have changed in the last year, and I've started making much lower thighs, and found that. I mean, less, less high, less, less, less strong thighs, and mm -hmm. found that um, helped the tone. But that might have just been, you know, that before I was making stupidly thick thighs. Um, depends <laughs> where your starting point is. Good thing um, to learn as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, it. it um, yeah. I'd be curious of other, if other, like since we have um, other experiences, if anyone else has done equivalent bridge experiments, 
you know, it, we, we often think, I mean, from my own experience as well, thinner and lighter in general is my preference, but I'm wondering if it's a variable, when, when would people choose to do something different? Like, for example, a lot of the old English bridges have a rather um, thick, I don't know what you call them, arms, you know, like the part that goes around the arms and hands, uh, is, you know, which I would assume would bring down the twist and the frequencies. And so I'm wondering if, you know, I, um, even if in your own experience, if you see more bridges from Florian or old hill bridges or beer bridges, if you associate sounds with any of those particular different styles. Um, I don't think I've got really a clear enough picture yet um, to, yeah. I'm not further ahead than you. I'm just, I'm just reaching. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Andreas, a, a practical question. What, um, what's the mix of um, your own instruments versus um, other instruments that you work on, work on in terms of setup? Uh, probably quite a few bridges outside, uh, you know, on, on customer instruments for, for every, Bridge on my instruments, I do. So quite a few more customer or you know mm -hmm. instruments no. not on my instrument. Yeah, it's no, so it's not. But I'm just curious if you, if you've been able to get more consistent patterns of your own instruments, you know, for, for your bridges. Yeah, that's where I've I've. I think, you know, quite honestly, on all of the instruments, um, but including mine, um, instead of just changed to, to more flexible, and that mm -hmm. seems to, to have worked um, in a way I would like to explore, but that's really more future fine-tuning. Um, after conversation last week, uh, when um, Jim mentioned the uh, impedance and possible impedance matching with the, with the island, that I could easily see that, you know, on my my own violins there with a fairly flexible top, that maybe <laughs> the, my, the, the, the uh, bridges could be lighter and on some other instruments, customer instruments, I might not go as light. Um, I think that's quite possible, but this is not something that I have yet observed and uh, paid enough um, attention to so i you know for me that's a hypothesis rather than an observation all right um andrew you're muted i'm trying to unmute here um uh the jumping mode you know the uh the, the vertical mode uh, is there any reason the bridge can't be flipped around and measured, like clamp the top of the bridge and apply the same mm. methodology to, to determine this, the strength of the thighs? Uh, yeah, 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 yes, there's That's a lot. Question. That's a question. <laughs> uh, Colin? So like clamp it this way, say. Uh, Colin, you've muted way yourself. Rather than this way. Colin, this you're muted. Oh, I'm still muted. Sorry, sorry, I apologize. Okay, okay. Now. Went wrong way. Yes, I mean, the, 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 there's a tremendous, in the bouncing mode, um, the outside edges of the um, bridge um, bounce much more than the inner um, inside edges. So you'd have to, yes, you could perhaps do it at a point or something, but you certainly wouldn't want to clamp it. You would destroy that mode completely. I've got, I'm, I've got finite element um, computations of bridges um, that show quite in detail um, how the bridge actually does rock and how, how it rotates and how it, the other modes come in when you hit things um, with a horizontal and vertical forces. Um, this is all on a rigid base structure. So certainly it's much more complicated than just even in plane. Um, um, 
uh, than just a single spring. In fact, there's another mode that occurs around about seven kilohertz, um, which actually is the top of the bridge and the ankle, it's, it's contra rocking. Um, so the, t the top part of the bridge is, is rocking in opposite direction to the, the ankles underneath the, the slots, as it were. Um, and now, those are the two, two modes that you excite with the in-plane um, horizontal forces. The vertical forces is, um, uh, is, excites the bouncing mode, but there's also another mode at a much higher frequency, um, which actually is close to, to 10 kilohertz, but that's the mode that you actually excite to start with when you tap a bridge. And it, you, that mode, has, to start with, has all the energy in it when you tap a bridge, and it's coupled via the, the bridge and the island area to the plates. So um, uh, I've got a picture, if anyone wants to look at it, um, they can. But, um, um, but, the actual, the, but the, by sure, the most important thing for a horizontal um, tap is, in fact, the... Um, uh, rocking frequency, and then at a higher frequency, there's this contra rocking of, of the the top and the bottom rotating in different directions. It's the ankles that do the the most of the rocking um, um, com in opposite direction to the top, and that, that 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 that's that's at about seven kilohertz. Tom, was that raised hand that you wanted to see the animations? No, it's yeah. not an animation. It's a static. Oh, it's or a, the, uh, Colin, uh, it's, but it did sound as though you may have exactly the images I was like wanting to to get. The the uh, sort of outer plane modal patterns. Yeah. Well, if, it, so, it, it, if it, I'm allowed to, to, to share a screen, I can show, show it. Well, can is there some way I could get get that to keep in my own records just to yeah, yes back? yes I mean it, it's all in a publication of, of mine um, okay. but but uh, I mean I can distribute it I, I, in fact what I've got is five slides just in case anyone's interested um, about the other problem of how the bridge uh, how the rocking frequency relates in fact to the real coupling of the uh, into yeah. the, the violin. Uh, uh, just wait I, a second, Colin. I just want to make sure that. that Andrew is done. Andrew, are you done? I guess so. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. And and Tom, did, was there something you wanted to bring up or ask first before we get to Colin? No, for me, I, I just wanted to ask Colin about getting access to what the stuff he just mentioned. All right. I, um, I can I can send you a copy of the paper. But I can. I what I've got is five slides here. Um, that, that I'll just only show one at the moment. Um, that might be of interest later on. Yeah. So, so 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 let's do this. Let's uh, let, let's give Andreas a, a a great round of applause for yeah. his presentation. And um, and um, is there any final words from Andreas before we go into overtime? Um. No, just thank you very much for having me and for listening to my, um, well, workshop ways. And mm -hmm. I would be very glad um, if some of you wanted to try it. And if you send me an email and you're interested, um, I'm very happy to send you basically uh, the spreadsheet that I've developed. Um, and then you can put your own data in if you want. Um, my email is andreas at hudelmeyer.com. So just send me an email and I can 